This is Dialogue Conspiracy. Political research specialist May Russell, whose conspiracy newsletter appears in The Realist magazine, has for three years shared with our listeners the fruits of her decades' research into political assassinations and the abuses of power in America. Her weekly commentary relates the news of the week to the evidence emerging about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains its power by force over America's electoral and executive processes. And now, here's May. Good afternoon, Monday afternoon, July 29th, 1974. Another warm, sunny day in Carmel Valley. Um, we'll roll right along with the news of the week and how it pertains to the past political assassinations and conspiracies and the current conspiracies still taking place among us. The impeachment proceedings are only a fraction of what is being concealed and we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, some of it makes me happy and some makes me wish that everything wasn't centered around Richard Nixon because the conspirators still have their network very tightly uh, working and Nixon's the fall guy. I mentioned last week an article on Chappaquiddick that was in the newspapers and our paper last Sunday had a full page article on it uh, and I referred to a book by Robert Cutler called You the Jury regarding Chappaquiddick. The address is Cutler Designs, 38 Union Street, Manchester, Massachusetts, 01944. You can write to Mr. Cutler and ask about the book, the price of the book, and he also did a book called On the Bullet 399, the famous bullet that was located outside of the street. It was underneath a stretcher at Parkland Hospital, and it was supposed to be the bullet that went through um, President Kennedy and John Conley. It was a planted bullet in a stretcher. He's done two books, one on that bullet and one on Chappaquiddick. The gentleman whose body um, maintains a big portion of that bullet, even though that bullet it was found whole and in very good shape, part of it, weighing a great deal more that should be out of it, was raw in the body of John Conley, who was indicted this morning at the Watergate. They're catching Mr. Conley, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, he has three indictments for perjury, I understand. In the Melt case, uh, it's been 10 years catching up with John Conley, and history would find him very much involved in the Kennedy assassination. But the conspirators have traveled 10 years on a road where they're just eking by now on the faintest uh, charges and hoping to get off. I hope history keeps working to dig these things out, including the amount of bullet that's in John Conley and the men who lied about bullet 399. The planning of that bullet reminds me of the planning of a cyanide bullet behind a bookcase of Patty Hearst and the police of the FBI revealing that months after her kidnapping. She was kidnapped in February of 74 and all of a sudden it makes headlines that this cyanide bullet was found at her apartment unbeknownst to her boyfriend and her family. Uh, this scattered, delayed evidence comes in every political assassination or conspiracy. The law enforcement are very quick to pick up all the evidence they need on very simple murder charges to go through an apartment, find what they need, and lay it down. But in order to back up a lie with more lies, they have uh, these large conspiracies have what they I call delayed evidence. And in every major conspiracy, that I have studied and where they have to back up the cover story, which is the major lie of accounting of what took place. The backup always comes with these little goodies that could have been revealed right from the start to give some indication of um, the way the crime would go or who was involved. But to support an original thesis, they bring in the accessories after the fact. Um, the SLA, we won't talk too much about probably because I'm still saturated from completing the article which is being printed now. There was a jailbreak in Sandpoint, Idaho. This last week, FBI agents joined the sheriffs. The headline of this UPI story was, SLA allies are linked to jailbreak. Now you know that the SLA for all purposes is over the original SLA as soon as the two Harrises and Patty Hearst are to be found. But in the article, I've broken what I call the SLA BC, the SLA AC, and the SLA CIA, because you're talking about three different branches of a large conspiracy that's going to be with us for a long time. 
That's what I printed. The SLABC were the group that got together before cremation. The AC are those that are about now the after cremation. And then the other group are the CIA and filtered provocateurs leaving their traces. So when we see the SLA allies, see they weren't supposed to have this many allies and they, they were all for all practical purposes defeated and burned or smoked out and killed. Now they have allies all of a sudden in Idaho and some man, three persons, were in a jailbreak. The UPI says, who are believed to have SLA connections. Now there's nothing to back up where these connections come from or how. And what is in the connections? There's a cabin with a stolen trailer at Rapid Lightning Creek in Idaho. And in the trailer was a picture of an SLA Cobra symbol and a cartridge case stuck in the dirt and it spelled out the letters SLA. Now any government provocateur who wants to say that the SLA are in Idaho, we'll have them in 50 states, they're in the Honduras, they're in Nicaragua, Guatemala, Puerto Rico, they will plant all this stuff and say, oh, these are their allies. Allies of what? On the one end, the media says we've caught them all except three, but here are their allies. And this is the kind of provocateur situation that's important to watch because men are being let out of the jail to join the SLA in order to have a counter reaction to this group. The prisons and the police departments are encouraging the enlistment in the CI, in the SLA, so that they have something to write about and chase. It's just a great big old rabbit hut. Now there's an article in the uh, Free Press that came out this week. I just got it today, the Los Angeles Free Press. And the cover story, it says, Inside the SLA, Recruitment for Terror. <clears throat> and it's got a picture of David, David Donaldson, Q. DeFries, and it says, Take two years of CIA after parole. If you're a short time or ready to take full advantage of parole this fall, by all means go to it. But if you think you get more out of financial security, consider the benefits of two years of terrorism. Guaranteed job training. With our two-year enlistment, you can choose a wide range of radical and reactionary extremist groups and if you qualify and have your training supplemented with devices as fa br favors, bribes, and the most modern psychosurgical techniques, and when your enlistment's over, there's up to 30 years of time at the prison of your choice. That's a cover story, and there's a long article in the L.A. Free Press on the recruitment inside the prisons, which I cover extensively in the article I've done. This one's by Tom Thompson called Inside the SLA on the anxiety of the law enforcement to recruit people inside the prisons to let them escape so that then the UPI and Idaho and all around the country and the police forces can sharpen their muscles and come in on the new SLA. There's no documented proof that these, they say SLA uh, allies in Idaho. I emphasize this over and over because this is the kind of thing that's going to keep going on for many years if we don't call a halt and ask them to produce the documentation. There was a religious, ridiculous chase down in Los Angeles this week. Cops ring Patricia apartment. And here's a girl, her name is Kelly Ravenscroft. She's 15 years old. Resembled the And the tag squad was out again in their uniforms. The media was out there by the hundreds. The Hearst were on an airplane, Randolph Hearst and his wife, to Los Angeles. Seems in action. It seems that television has taken to the streets and uh, you can follow the crowd. The press got a tip off and they were there by the hundreds and they say they, they disarranged the family to drive down. There's a telephone call synchronized from a man who's Mr. Harris and there's supposed to be Patty asking for her uncle. And this big thing was on television the other night all lit up as if it was a big event. They were gonna capture Patricia Hurst. We can expect a lot of this, but it gives the boys a chance to get into their uniforms and justify their existence because they must be getting dusty and they need a little street scene. And I'm very cynical about the entire law enforcement and the prison system and bitter about it. And I'll be hammering away at it every time they stage one of these shows until you hopefully think that it's getting a little disgusting and you're right, the Attorney General, and you're right, men in Sacramento, and say, get off of it. We think that there's something more to this story and you're lying to us, which they're doing. Well, the news of the week, I guess, has to be the impeachment proceedings of Richard Nixon. Two years ago, I wrote an article that he was an unindicted conspirator. Uh, we're getting to the point, I think, the news this afternoon on in our local station said that even his language sounded a little bit despondent as if things aren't going jolly well. 
uh, the President of the United States has to have 22 million people maybe uh, watch all of his dirty linen aired on the television. There's something sad about this whole thing. Um, the same problems remain. I look at it and I can't say hallelujah for about 1,000 reasons. The domestic spying is worse than ever. The plumbers were replaced with a group called the Defense Investigative Service that I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on. Secret operation that does everything, including work with hostages, which could be the team behind the SLA. Uh, they're in full force now, and we're starting in 71. The plumbers were only set up to make sure Richard Nixon, Nixon got elected. They were to take care of Muskie and Wallace and the deed of beard embarrassment and Ted Kennedy and all the obstacles to getting the master in the White House. And so the plumbers isn't important. The election's over and he got in. So all the embarrassment um, isn't important about the plumbers per se because in 71, Richard Nixon had set up a larger spy plan which went into practice in April 72 that was grandiose in, hidden in the Pentagon much bigger than the plumber's operation ever was. That was a part-time job, which I don't believe for a minute was only because of certain leaks. I think leaks are allowed out of the White House as an excuse to have the plumbers. And then the plumbers could do all the political maneuvering. The committee to reelect the president had nothing to do with the Republican Party. It was a spy operation of its own to assure that the man got elected that they wanted Richard Nixon. And the plumbers, uh, the leaks that came out of the White House that were given to Jack Anderson on the Pakistan Indian affair, all of those leaks are set out purposely. That's what Charles Colson did. That's what other people in the White House did. By letting out a leak, they had an excuse to have Hunt and Liddy. And once Hunt and Liddy were in the White House, the leak problem of Kissinger's papers going to Admiral Murr was solved in 71. And Admiral Murr was, the chief joint of staff was promoted after they discovered the papers were taken to his desk that were for eyes only for the president. And they've come out and said that's regular policy the Pentagon takes those papers. So the purpose of having these plumber, the plumber unit of Hunt and Liddy and the whole team and then Barker and the whole Cuban group was to assure that Richard Nixon stayed in in 72 and they could let out leaks themselves to bring in the plumbers because it wasn't a big deal. They used them in the city 68 elections, and they've been working this way for a long time. So bringing them in at that point in history was only for one purpose, and our problems aren't solved when Hunt and Liddy are out of office or out of power with their little trips and don't think they are. So I would think of domestic spying, it's worse than ever, and I'll read you some evidence of it. The Supreme Court decision in the last weeks, there were five decisions that the New York Times and Washington Post had a long article that said it will make the end of the beginning of civil rights movements in the prisons. We were just beginning to change those. They referred to the, the end of the beginning of the civil rights. Whenever things get to get better, they're getting worse because the same people in power decided that's the way it should be. That's why these people were appointed so that there are the prohibitions against reporters to see prisoners. We've talked about those. They cannot confront or cross-examine an accuser at disciplinary hearings, and, and they cannot call a witness in their defense. That means a man can go to jail, uh, like in California, the indeterminate sentence, one year to life, and then a man can come along, a jury can say, well, we'll give you, say, three years. And if they get, he gets in there and he gets political or aware of why he's in there or educates himself when he's in there, and become smart about what's really happening in this country, then they can slap all kinds of charges and he can find himself never getting out because once he was in the prison, he wouldn't play their game, whether it's dope dealing, whether it's killing another prisoner, whether it's turning on politically. Once he's in those doors, the, the California Department of Corrections and in other states across the country do the same thing. They can bring someone to accuse a man. He can't have a lawyer. He doesn't know who's doing it. So he's meeting a jury two times. But the second time, it's so prejudiced, as if the first one wasn't rigged, he has to meet it the second time. And the Supreme Court says that's okay. And then they turned down the right of youthful offenders to be eligible for sentencing under the Federal Youth Corrections Act. The judge says that he can decide whether or not they're eligible for that. Well, there were five setbacks, um, and they would not give ex-felons voting rights. Five setbacks in the last week to the Supreme Court decisions. 
Money is still impounded by the billions of Roy Ash, the, an illegal body, which is causing economic chaos in this country that is causing future racism and uh, job opportunities are not available, youth opportunities. So the impeachment proceeding per se isn't thrilling me to death. There are some good things about the impeachment proceedings that are going on this week that started. In the first place, the Americans are getting an education, and some of them, I think, are still in shock. They see the attorney general, former attorney general, being uh, defamed or talk about. Mr. Patrick Gray, the FBI, was removed. Uh, there's an indictment against John Ehrlichman, the, the closest aide to the president outside of Robert Haldeman. Ed Reinecke, the assistant governor out here in California, got uh, was found guilty this week on his perjury charges. Uh, he fought hard. He said first he was ill, and then he said he didn't mean to do it, and he didn't know that the difference between a lie, but the jury didn't fall for that, and Reinecke was found guilty. John Connolly, the master conspirator with the Nazis down in Jamaica and into the oil cartels, uh, you know, the governor of Texas at the time of Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby and, and that conspiracy to kill Robert John Kennedy in Dallas. Uh, Connolly's been indicted. A lot of people that thought they were totally immune to being touched all these years on such major gross crimes are being put to court and people are in a state of shock. I think the American people still don't know quite how to accept uh, these people that they trusted with a blanket entrustment. Uh, they're getting a lesson by listening to these bloody crimes and sneaky things on the television. Unfortunately, it's all centered on Richard Nixon and dispersed and everyone squealed to get Nixon and his cohorts are getting off too easy. Um, James Baldwin says, as, as about the Watergate, he can't get too excited. He said, you can't deal with people for whom you have no respect. And having done political research for 10 years, I look at them and sometimes I pity them. I have very little respect for them or what they represent. But it's good to see other people learning a little bit about some of the th crimes, say, that President and his cohorts have done and hear it read on the media because most people will accept the media and they don't pick up a book and study very much these things that are happening. The second uh, good thing about the impeachment proceedings is that even old crooks finally get caught. You know, 20, 30 years or whatever, some of them, uh, William Sullivan of Division 5, the FBI, is sitting away having his heart attack and uh, all these different people are fading away. They, they've isolated certain people, and but the main ones, and I think this impeachment is symbolic. People of my generation, maybe the younger ones, a lot of them listen to the show, haven't lived through the whole Richard Nixon cycle, but certainly my generation and uh, anyone 40 or older uh, would appreciate the pathos that it came down on Nixon because he is a symbol of everything this country uh, dragged its feet about from the time he got into office, the Cold War, the Alger his case that made him famous, the killing of the Rosenbergs, the witch hunting, the House on American activities. Um, he was in this Navy and he was called by Committee of Hundred in California to represent them in Congress in the House of Representatives, aerospace people, agriculture, the Bank of America, and so he didn't have an idea of his own. He was a front man for the vested interests and now they're all jumping on him and all of their multiple crimes seem to be compounded in him. Even his checkers speech defending money that Howard Hughes gave him that he wasn't supposed to be taking in those days. If he just stayed on the salary of a House of Representatives man all those years, you know, for 20 years, he'd be in better shape today in retirement, in integrity, and so forth. And then it's harder to go up to the top, the very top, with a full mandate and have all those corpses behind you and fall so darn fast and have everything tumbling down to you. It's a symbol of going from nowhere to the top and going all the way down just about to the bottom of the barrel in terms of self-respect. Your wife's giving back her earrings and birthday present and, and to people he wasn't supposed to collect from and your taxes are investigated and you have to borrow money on your home to pay the taxes and you're publicly divulged for being uh, a crook and not upholding oaths of office you took and so forth. So it's symbolic. Uh, Nixon was dragged into the Dallas scene. He was at the home of Clint Merchinson, the oil man. I've talked about on many shows. November 21st, 1963, with J. Edgar Hoover. They knew he was selected as the President of the United States, and they knew he was. So he had to be in Dallas that day, so they all had a part in that bloodbath. 
and he left Love Airfield an hour before John Kennedy arrived. Mr. Murchison's name comes out now in secret memos and John LaRue's testimony or other persons that he gave money to Rosemary Wood in 1968 that Nixon didn't record, that Rosemary didn't record, the same Clint Murchison, the same oil people whose home these meetings were planned the night that, that Kennedy allegedly, this took place in the garden the night before Kennedy was killed. Um, he gave 150,000 Clint Merchants into the 72 campaign, but he has been patting Nixon. They've all been in this together, and one by one, maybe uh, history will unfold, but right now they're not hitting the important things I would hope they would do, but it's tragic enough as it is. The third reason something's coming out of this is, I guess, my spiritual um, side, my belief in the law of compensation. I've talked about it, like Emerson's essay. You can't do so much bad and ever succeed to be the top, the leader of the world, the free world, uh, and have the respect of anyone around you. Uh, this Cold War, the people in power that have manipulated since World War II, they can't pull so many murders, so many conspiracies, and end up on top. The law of compensation, the pendulum, someday swings, and now it's swinging. And I think Daniel Ellsberg was a beginning where a conscience surfaced and he helped start the war in Vietnam, the paperwork, the footwork, and his conscience worked. And then we had other people, Tack, Louis Tackwood surfaced to expose the L.A. Police Department and Frank Martinez, the Chicano Moratorium in L.A. and Larry Shears, the plans of the Treasury Department, Internal Revenue, making ready to kill Cesar Chavez and Eldridge Cleaver, then Victor Marchetti now with the cult of intelligence coming out, and Colonel Anthony Hebert and the new book by Albie on the CIA. And so out of all of this, the pendulum swings and people see what they're doing, causing slavery and poverty and uh, killing a lot of good people for nothing. And so the law of compensation is catching up. And another good thing out of the Watergate is the fourth thing is the uncertainty. Because people who have never done anything wrong in this country, if you were born black, you didn't know when your house would be set fire, when you would be charged with a rape you didn't do if you walked down the street or looked at a white woman or where you would get a job or if you'd be the first shipped out to be murdered the front lines in the war. A lot of people have lived with uncertainty in this country. Would you get into college? Could you have a college education? Uh, would you be framed for crimes? A lot of things uh, people have been framed or taught fear for no reason because of their color or their financial circumstances. So now we have a new kind of fear in this country. We have the fear of agencies doing illegal work, illegal operations, or attorney generals or governors or the attorney general of this state. Um, you have Evel Young or you have uh, Ronald Reagan, the governor. Who's going to tell about what they received, what money they got, how much their plane ride cost out of town for campaign? They weren't supposed to spend the taxpayers' money. When will they call to tell a lie? What judge is going to say, look, you committed perjury? When will a judge turn like Judge Sirica, who's appointed by Republicans, and say, I've had enough of your dirty tricks? Who will the people be who are going to squeal at the military out of Fort Ord, at Presidio? Who's going to tell on them when their martial law plans are being planned? And what guard in prison? What prisoner is sending a letter saying, you gave me a knife to kill somebody, and I'm not going to kill them. I'm going to tell the lawyers. I'm going to tell the media. Uh, you give me something for narcotics traffic. You, you left this prison, and now you're dealing in narcotics up in such and such a city. The guards have done illegal work. The police have done illegal work. The Justice Department, the Attorney General, uh, Congressman, I have a thing here down, an investigation of immigration down in Mexico, and they've hushed this, this inv investigation up because it involves certain congressmen. And I want to go at length in that if we have time. And... The, and uh, uh, being fixed up with, with a lot of illegal activity along the Mexican border. They're trying to hush it and close the investigation. There's a conflict to open it or close it. Everybody who's committed an illegal crime is vulnerable from this day on, and he doesn't have to be black, Chicano, Indian, poor, white, unrepresented. The top can fall. He may go to a fancy jail like Lompoc. He may go to Allen's town in Pennsylvania. He may go to a jail that isn't a jail. And get unfair treatment in a sense, but it's still not the same. They're going to lose their law degrees. They could go to jail a little longer like Charles Colson and not have such a farm. They will learn, people will learn, that serving the agency like Bernard Barker or Sturgis or Martinez, I have an article here today by one of those men on what a bummer it is to be let down. And how do these agents feel when they hear on national television the impeachment hearings and you hear the president talking about those jackasses that are sitting in jail? 
and you're doing it for him, and he told him for his country, and it's only for his reelection. There's no national security involved. How many of you out there are going to take those jobs? I reach a lot of people in the military and in the prisons, and I'm glad I do. And across the country, uh, students and young people at universities being recruited for the CIA. Uh, how many of you want that job? Think about it. If it's illegal and you know what the laws are and you know you're going to be betrayed and your momentary uh, money is, is nothing, and you'd be killed afterwards, the chances are nobody's going to stand by you. What kind of a job is it? Or is it better to work for more equal opportunity and stop impounding federal funds and get the show on the road and get money for building housing and schools and hospitals and medical schools and uh, all kinds of trades that we need? Trade unions are tied up. Let's get some jobs and get other kinds of jobs so that we don't depend upon government jobs that kill us in the end and have no glory in the first place. So the well, best thing I can see out of this whole thing is this law of compensation, the uncertainty of uh, the people doing all their dirty work that they don't know when they'll be caught, and the irony of Richard Nixon being the one inside that White House. Uh, the taxpayers had to pay for the masked balls of his daughters and all that stupidity that went on. Uh, it's all over. The White House got orders today. No one on the street can take photographs. Is he going to cry? Is he going to trip? What's happening? No one can photograph the great mansion. Uh, the curtains will be drawn next, and it's just about over. It's symbolic. We can't hang around there. Well, I have several things. I, some more. We'll go on to another subject. Uh, apropos, there's two things I want to talk about. One is the Berkeley Barb this week has a long article, and I made the front page. It says, Is May Brussel a government patsy? And it's a long article written by somebody from New York, Rex Weiner, who accuses Paul Krasner for publishing my material and me of being government patsies because of the kind of thing which I'm putting out. Now, you can't be in public life uh, as long as I've been. This is We're into the fourth year now uh, of the radio show, completed three full years. And I'm writing some pretty heavy articles, so I have to expect that from somewhere... I'm not universally loved, and there is a counterattack. So the, it's beautiful not to attack any of the research or the documentation that I throw out, but he's throwing out that I'm serving the purposes of the government by linking all these conspiracies together and putting down the SLA. And there's just a few points that I would answer to the article because I really don't want to deal with it at great length. You might find it interesting. It's the Berkeley Barb this week. Um, July 26. <laughs> you know, it's funny. If you wanted to call somebody a dirty name or smear them years ago, you had all kinds of adjectives to do it. You know, like you you could challenge the documentation or the work or the facts. But t the dirtiest word you can say today is to say someone's a government patsy. <laughs> That's how low the government is. To be a, to work for them is is really about as low as you can get. So, in that sense, the author is is questioning. He really is questioning. Uh, my right to say that there are no radical groups out there working and that um, they're all in and that because the SLA is a CIA that therefore there are no other radical groups and of course he's wrong about that what the author says I'll just bring up three points he says if my theories are true about how bad the world is and that we're in a police state that I say give up don't work don't publish your underground papers don't work for the food co-op uh, stop your work, it's all over. Well, anyone who knows me knows that I work 16 to 18 hours a day trying to expose the methods by which the police state gets worse. It, as long as I can use this radio and talk to as many people as I use every week, and Paul Grazer could publish an article of anything, you know, with, with facts and documents, naming people in, high up in government, trying to expose them, like I did in the other Realist article trying to expose Patrick Gray or Robert Marty and, and John Mitchell and Richard Nixon um, or Robert Bennett from Mullen Associates. Anyone who knows my work knows that as long as the media is available to me, I will expose the people who keep the police state going, such as Roy Ash in the Office of Management Budget, who's an absolute devil. Everything that is evil has his name signed to it. And I don't say give up. If I thought it meant give up, I have property in Canada with waterfalls and I have 14 acres. Another friend bought 14 acres. I would be sitting under the waterfalls now because there's nothing keeping me here except the fight. And I'm not saying give up. Um, the second point he says is that I, I claim that violence per se is a discreditable tactic. 
I believe sincerely that violence per se has only meaning in a very necessary situation, and I've never been in a position where it's been necessary for me to say that a gun works. I remember meeting Angela Davis just about a year before she was framed, and I wanted to go into the Martin Luther King conspiracy because I felt that as long as these people can get away and conspire and blame these murders like on James Earl Ray who didn't shoot him, then they can frame Angela Davis, they can lock her up, they can kill her, they can do anything, get away with it. That The conspirators are very much in power. The information's available, let's use it and eke them out. And she said, if you don't have a carbine, I won't come talk to you. Well, she wouldn't because I don't have a carbine and I don't believe in shooting out. And I do believe that a lot of good investigative reporters like Woodward and Bernstein have brought people out like Marie Stans and Robert Mardian, who was the granddaddy of the grand jury holocaust. People now are discrediting the grand juries or Guy Godwin, who worked for him, or Lennis Leonard, who founded the LEAA. These people are out, and Mr. Kleinitz is out. Mr. Reinquist is sitting his time out at the, su at the Supreme Court on these hearings. He still has a certain amount of power. But John Mitchell was one of the most evil men in U.S. history of government. He's out. And the second team, I'm working to get out the next team that I think are war criminals, like Mr. Colby of the CIA, Mr. Hunt, who's now the ambassador to Iran, and uh, Mr. Helms, rather. And I think that Mr. William Saxby and Mr. Kelly of the FBI are not to represent us with the FBI or the Justice Department. I think they're, and Mr. Gerald Ford, who was on the Warren Commission, is the most dangerous man to have as president. But I can't see any advantage to shooting Gerald Ford when you can get him out like Richard Nixon got out. There's so much evidence on Gerald Ford if it can be presented and compiled to the proper authorities at the right time, and a lot of it's coming in. We, somebody asked Gerald Ford uh, in an interview last night on television, if Richard Nixon is impeached, will you resign? And he was taken back, you know, kind of in a state of shock. There's no reason why that man shouldn't be out of government totally because he was on the Warren Commission and it was a bigger cover-up than the Watergate. And the president is right in saying that he isn't the first person who did these things, but I don't think we should have liars as the president of the United States and being as the Warren Report is the biggest lie the country produced. Uh, I don't see why Gerald Ford should be there, but I think it's more effective to get a team of researchers around the country, and this is what we're trying to do, to get people out of power, say like Evel Younger, who is who is a general in the military, he's our attorney general, he's behind major conspiracies in this country, I'd rather get him out, I'd rather free the political prisoners, and we're going into the problem of Greece. Greece was overthrown for seven years, I did extensive work on that, and talk about that in a minute. But the government, the military, threw up their hands yesterday, or not yesterday, this week, and said, you can have it back, civilians, we don't want it. I believe we should have informers inside the FBI, CIA, inside the prison, squealing and passing information to get the illegal people in office out. I think we should sabotage machines, computer machines or data banks, and feed them wrong information about conspirators if we have access to them, because they put in lies about us. And, they're, and we're not criminals, that we should feed others' names into that. And to get, if you took a hundred innocent names and put them into those data banks, if you work in the military, and those people were followed, they would break open the whole system because someday they'd say, wait, I'm not on that. And they'd have to break open all the data banks to find out how the wrong names got in there. So there's millions and millions of names in these military data banks. I think you should feed, go get a telephone directory and feed it with all the wrong names you can. I don't see anything wrong with that. They're, if they're going to list everyone that they want uh, from a particular demonstration, a rock concert, then you should get everyone who goes to a golf tournament. I don't see what the difference is. Uh, and feed it with wrong information and bust the machine, overload it with the wrong names. And you'd find that the data banks then would be stopped. I think there's things to do to reveal and expose people to empower who are war criminals. I just feel that it's more important to work this way than with the weapons because, first of all, the forces that be want a physical confrontation. They have s built their muscles around tanks, arms, helicopters surfacing. You can't beat them. Their uniforms, their fire bombs, uh, they wipe you out before you can even surface to say your name if you were in the house down on 54th Street with the SLA. Were. So I don't see how you can oppose this thing, the one thing that you do have in a war, and I believe this country was overthrown in 63, you have truth if you believe in what you're doing and you have facts and information and you're up front. You can be up front because you have nothing to hide. 
and conspirators and people who commit assassinations are always secret. They have to have secret drops. They have to leave places. They use aliases. They have to travel. They have several bank accounts. If you work at a bank, you can find who's a, a spook. You know, if you live in a certain apartment house, you can eke them out, blow their covers. There's a lot people can do to stop the spy system. I could. Uh, that was one of the arguments in the article in the Berkeley Bar that May Brussels a government patsy. It says she offers no solutions. Well, I've only published two articles in my life, and in fact, the third one is at the printers now. And if you read the exposure of the My Lai uh, massacres in Vietnam, or you read Woodward and Bernstein's exposures of the Watergate, they don't offer you solutions. I'm an investigative reporter telling you what I find or see. If, if Ramparts Magazine carries an expose of the CIA as a cover for police in Vietnam, or a co they use the University of Michigan, they put out a very good article, but the same article doesn't offer a solution. There's no way that many articles that reveal the truth have to give you a solution in the same article. This poor fellow is scared to death that if what I say is true, everyone should go in hiding and give up, and that Paul and I are feeding out nightmares to people, and we're being very mean because we're feeding everyone's paranoia that they should just go. He says you should go in a, a corner that we've taken him to some dark recess and uh, given paralysis of despair with a, this is what he says, with a morbid obsession of recounting tales of the enemy's awesome power. Well, I believe that they have power, and I'm not full of despair. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm not filled with despair. But if you don't think they have power, you don't know your enemy. That doesn't mean you can't uh, overtake them, but you have to know who you're dealing with. Just like to cure a disease, you have to make a diagnosis. And what I try to do on the radio or on, in my articles is to throw out what I see symptoms and this is what I think is causing them. And you can look into the symptoms and see how they line up with your experience. Uh, it was very important that the Greek government was overthrown this last week. And the American equipped army funded by Roy Ash's uh, Lytton Industries as a conduit of funds caused a military hunt in April 21st, 1967. 20,000 people were arrested immediately. They weren't told their charges. They were swept off the street, and there were edicts that came down that night. No gathering in the open country of more than five persons. No gathering in closed places except for public entertainment. No amateur radio stations uh, or receiving or transmitting could be taking place. No hoarding of food. No hunting licenses. No beard or long hair. No miniskirts. Mandatory church on Sunday. History books were rewritten and handed out the next day on racial purity. All theaters and screenwriters submitted their scripts. Music and composers were censored. It was the first fascist-type dictatorship since Mussolini and Hitler. There's a good book, the Stephen Rousseau's book. Uh, it's called Death of Democracy, Greece and the American Conscience. Well, this last week, the military gave up. We can put ourselves in a position where the military, people like General Haig at the White House, want to be Joint Chiefs of Staff. If he's caught wiretapping, he'll get away with it this time. Maybe he won't get away with it always. And uh, you can keep an eye on these people and make it so difficult for them that they're not going to run the country any more than they wanted in Greece. The first edict was that um, pri prisoners were freed. They open up the prisoners. Now, Agnew was in Greece recently. I think this has something to do with the handwriting on the wall. Tom Pappas, who had a, a key to the White House walking in and out, isn't welcome anymore. Onassis' son was murdered at the airport in Greece. They don't have, they're they not having so much fun running that military dictatorship, believe me. And they're handing it back. The way to free Rochelle McGee or Hugo Pinnell and the San Quentin Six and Marion Carr and California's political prisoners is to change the regime, make it so difficult for the military people, and then get the right people in who are humanistic, who look at the record, open the door, just like when uh, Portugal was taken over, the prisoners were out. There's not going to be a shootout at San Quentin that these guys are looking forward to. They're ganging up on sides of this big revolutionary movement. They're all going to be murdered. I don't believe that it's, there's any purpose to... Work with this system, having your gun, and opposing that many people with all of their weapons. I think because the rulers have taken the power illegally, run it illegally, run the prisons through narcotic traffic, bringing in weapons, encouraging gang warfare, um, doping a lot of prisoners, feeding poison in their food, holding them down, and injecting drugs that change their personalities. 
I'm collecting evidence on this, and so are other people. And these are war criminals. So we get out the Nuremberg war criminal thing. More people are interested in this. They're working on it. Then we free our political prisoners. That's the way I work it. Um, in Cyprus, we put in a man, a CIA man, a guerrilla assassin. Uh, he worked as, as its cover as a newspaper photographer for years. That was his spy cover. And there was an article in the paper this week. He was referred to as the chief executioner. They said frequently he took pictures of scoops of street killings, and they claimed he did both the shooting and the photography. Samson lasted a week in Cyprus, and he was out. The people couldn't stand him. They knew what he was. He tried right away to have a press conference and hold up all the weapons of torture that the regime before him did. Everyone knew that he was the chief executioner of Cyprus, and that was the end of him. Now, a long time ago, two years ago, I compared the overthrow of Greece to what this country was going into and uh, went at length the comparison with Roy Ash controlling our Office of Management budget. And in the second realist that came out last year, there was a letter from Andreas Papandro, and I'll read it to you on the air for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, this is what he wrote to me. Well, this was two years ago that he wrote to me when my first article came out. He said, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of work you have done and the documentation you bring to support your thesis. I've tried myself for a long time to bring out the conspiratorial aspect of the Greek coup of 1967, which means the American coup, and now, six years later, it does seem possible that people are beginning to understand how it happened, that Greece went into a dictatorship. You see, because I was comparing America on the verge in 72 of this dictatorship. He said, your work is tremendously important. You have understood the framework in which these events take place. But more than that, you have dug out the facts. Now, Papa Gross hardly would think that I was a government agent in bringing out these facts. So I take the Barb article as being an a last-ditch attempt, maybe there'll be a lot more, to smear what I'm trying to say because now I'm reaching too many people. So it's inevitable that they come in with this kind of a smear, which we can take and examine and read it at length if you want. And again, the article that I have at the printers now will be the best answer to that kind of an article. Um, there was another article about preventive detention. In Washington last week, they threw out the, the Congress threw out the no-knock law, which means that they can't come in your house without knocking. But once they knock, they can come in. You see, this the no-knock, they can't walk in without knocking, but they can still come in. But in the same uh, vein this week, the court backed again, the court, D.C. Court of Appeals backed the law that it, they said the constitutionality of the controversial law that you can be taken to prison without bail uh, before trial and you don't necessarily have to have committed a crime if they think you're potentially dangerous off you go well that is still in existence and those are the kind of things I would like to see change I would like to know that somebody has committed a crime and that is why he's taken to jail and not because somebody doesn't like your color or your friends or the place that you go to try to solve your political problems there's another article about book seven of the impeachment of Richard Nixon. You'll be reading it or hearing it on the air. You'll read it in the paper. And it was the formation of his secret police, the uh, plumbers plan. It was it was worse than the plumbers. This was that White House Houston plan that involved uh, Vice Admiral Bennett, Lieutenant General D.V. Bennett of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Noel Gaylor, Director of the National Security Agency. And um, the book of impeachment goes into the fact that J. Edgar Hoover was very much against this whole spy system and that it was important that we don't have it. He, he becomes a great civil libertarian. But as you read the impeachment story and you read behind the arguments, you become I become more convinced than ever that J. Edgar Hoover was murdered. At the time, he was taken off with no autopsy in a very strange kind of car. Uh, not the hearse, and it was very timely because this plan had to go through. And synchronized with that plan, I only have a few minutes left to go. Uh, would like to next week do it at length. Talk about the other plan. It's called the Defense Investigative Service. Service, and it was formed in 1972. Now you have to keep in mind the historical consequence. In October 72, this would set up. November were the elections, and Richard Nixon was sure to win. And in October 72, these particular men set up this very secret 
police force, the military intelligence revised all of their plans with Lieutenant General Donald Bennett, the same man who was behind the Houston, what they called the Houston plan in 1970 that Nixon said he didn't sign. But Nixon signed this one. The White House approved with Nixon, Commander in Chief, in 1972, and it was first set up February 17, 71. It's called the Defense Investigative Service, and this goes into spying on civilians, and they have a very large organization. And October 72 would be one month before the election. So when the Houston plan was turned down by J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Nixon said he shelved, then he gave permission for this new intelligence organization to go into effect. And it was to work on the intention of national security, that national defense means national security, covering the political, economic, social, and military life. And those are the four areas, the political, of killing candidates, the economic, the racism, social, our hippies, and counterculture, military, or anti-war movements. I'll spend more time on that next week. Our time is up. It's in a magazine called Saga Magazine, a small magazine this month. And this is the most dangerous plan, which is in operation right now, but the congressmen are trying to put some reins on it, and we'll talk about it at length next week. Listen to the impeachment hearings and uh, take some good mental notes, written notes. Save your papers for your children and grandchildren someday, and I'll see you next week. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for over 10 years has been researching the facts behind the political assassinations in this country so that the truth may be revealed. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. With gramophones and things usual forwardness, the store is looking...